when we left off on Friday, um, we finished the amulet of Samarkand with Nathaniel sending Bartimaeus away. And Bartimaeus is going to say something in this book uh, when he's brought back um, about their agreement. Because when Nathaniel sends him away, what does he agree not to do? Or what does he suggest he won't do? He won't bring him back. Okay? To make a clean break, so to speak. And Bartimaeus, and I, I forgot to bring um, Amulet of Samarkand with me, otherwise I'd refer to it. Bartimaeus um, essentially says some things to, to Nathaniel, gives him some advice. Uh, anybody know what any of that advice is? For example, he says something about his new master. Don't trust her. Don't trust her. Okay? His new master is Jessica Whitwell. Notice what she's in charge of. The entire security apparatus. Okay? Um, we don't have somebody comparable in our government who's in charge of <coughs> ultimately the entire security apparatus. I mean, the closest we would have would probably be somebody like um, the Director of National Intelligence, okay? An office created post 9-11 to kind of unite the alphabet soup security groups, CIA, NSA, uh, NIA, uh, Naval Intelligence, Defense Intelligence, all those different groups. The reason I say we don't have anything completely analogous is even Henry Duvall falls somewhat under her purview. Okay? Um, local police departments do not fall under the purview of the National Director of Intelligence. They don't fall under the purview of the FBI, which is why, you know, when you have um, major events 9-11 and, you know, the Twin Towers coming down in New York, which is why you always have turf battles between local authorities and federal authorities. And what federal authorities tend to do is say, our power trumps yours. We, we have authority, etc. And most of the time it does, but sometimes it doesn't, okay? So he, he tells Nathaniel, don't trust your new boss. What else? Who else does he say not to trust? Anybody. <clears throat> Anybody. Okay? And he says one of the reasons for that is, you know, the, <clears throat> you're still not totally one of them yet. That is, you've not been completely corrupted. Okay? Why does he tell him that? Don't. He's saying, don't be corrupted. Don't buy what they're selling. Don't listen to everything you are told. <clears throat> Why? Nathaniel was taught well by his history tutor, right? What, is his, what did his history tutor teach him about the government? As opposed to say, okay, this represents the government. These two aren't in the government, but they're hangers on. Or they're supporters of the government. These are obviously not, because these are all what? Or at least we're led to believe this. These are all commoners, okay? His history te teacher teaches him to think what? About the government, as opposed to commoners. These people are all noble. They're honorable. 
they essentially sacrifice themselves for the good of what? Everybody else. Okay. When does he have his rude awakening about what he was taught from the ages of, from when he was first brought over to the Underwoods until sometime in his 12th year? Louder? Loveless. Loveless. Who teaches him what on the day that the Underwoods are murdered? There is no honor. There is no nobility. There is no looking out for others. It's what? It's all about me and what I want. It's all about gaining power. Why? To rule over others. Okay? So, that's all background, right? Because that first book is designed to set up this whole world and the conflict between this side and this side. Seemingly. Seemingly. Why? Is the conflict really ultimately between magicians and commoners? Does Loveless in the first book really have a problem with commoners? Are they really a plague to him? No, they're not. Who are? Other magicians. The conflict is really here. Okay? And here we could go off, you know, onto a... a Tolkienian applicability thing and talk about how this is applicable to our real world. Okay? Talk about the government, you know, all that kind of thing. But I'm not going to. So, we get this book. Golem's Eye. Okay? And it starts with... I'm going to talk about all these characters in a moment. It starts with a <laughs> prologue. Okay? And the prologue gives us the date, 1868. It's set in Prague. What's the purpose of the prologue? Bill's not like, I don't know. Who are we introduced to? Who do we actually see in action? Um, Starts with a guh. Yeah. Nathaniel wanted to take this guy's name. Gladstone. William Gladstone. Okay. We see him in action. Who else do we see in action? Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus. Okay. And we get, you know, typical Bartimaeus repartee between Bartimaeus and other quote-unquote demons. We find out, you know, Bartimaeus has strengthened the walls of Prague, etc. And they said, yeah, but didn't you also strengthen the walls of Jericho and all these other places, you know, where the walls came tumbling down, so to speak? You know, where these other demons are kind of picking on Bartimaeus and such. Okay. So what's the... What's the purpose there? What also do we see? Gladstone has something. We have his staff. Okay. Which we find out, or we will find out in the course of this novel, is a very powerful magical object. What very powerful magical object have we already been introduced to First book, the title. The Amulet of Samarkand, right? It's got a powerful magical entity embedded in it. Well, we will find out. So does this, right? Then we jump to present day. Part one. We get a description of London. A couple pages in. We find out the time frame, not time frame in the sense of what year it is, because we never know that, do we? We don't know if it's 1968, 1988. We know it's over 100 years since Gladstone, because we've been told in the first book it's been 100 years since Gladstone. Okay, So at the earliest, it's 1968. At the latest, it's probably published 2004, 98, you know, early 2000, something like that. So, here's the time frame we get. More than two years had passed since the time of Lovelace's rebellion. So, John was 12 when he got the amulet, gave it to Rupert Devereux. Now he's 14, okay? 
He's going to tell us later on, when he summons Bartimaeus, exactly how long it's been. It's been two years and eight months. So he's close to 15. Okay. So, skip a bit. He's grown a bit. His master is Jessica Whitwell, 25. He has a new apartment. Okay, he's 14. He has an apartment of his own. Big apartment, we're told. Okay. Big, shiny, Riverside townhouse. Page 25. Okay. We're told it's clean, it's antiseptic. It signaled control, clarity, efficiency. Cool. So, what else? Because he had been taken under her wing, she became his master. She starts training him. Top of 26. We find out what he progresses from and to. And then we're told, which of course, you know, all of that was really nothing to him because he'd already done all that. That is, he progressed from the lowest level of demon to advanced jinn of various castes in a matter of days. Why is that significant? It's not. She thinks it's important. She thinks it tells us, wow, this kid's really on the rise. She doesn't know. He's already raised a 14th level gen. Notice, we're told he keeps Bartimaeus completely secret. So if he keeps Bartimaeus completely secret, how does he explain how he got the actual amulet? You know, because... It's implied there, there had to be, the way Bartimaeus and he talked about it at the end of the previous book, there had to be two people involved, you know, distract attention, get the horn, get the amulet, etc. Well, he apparently doesn't have to, right? So, what else? He's now risen high enough that we're told, page 29, next chapter, Within months, he'd maneuvered his way, bottom of the page, he'd maneuvered his way through a succession of humdrum clerical jobs until, not yet 15, he'd become assistant to the internal affairs minister himself. So he's not yet 15, and he's now direct assistant to the minister of internal affairs. Real world, our world analogy would be being assistant to, okay, this uh, assistant to Gina Has Haspel, I think is her last name, CIA director at 15. I take that back. Not yet 15. Um, what kind of power does that give you? What kind of responsibility does that give you? What kind of access to secrets does that give you? Okay, your security clearance would be, you know, out the wazoo for that. Okay? And he's not yet 15. So what does this tell us about the government and him? They obviously trust him, right? What's one of the reasons they trust him? Assume for the moment this is the amulet. He gets it at 12 years old. What does he do? He gives it to the government. He shows his loyalty there. Okay? So, we're told, page 30 and following, his, his boss, not his master, Julius Tallow is his boss, Jessica Whitwell is his master. Okay? We're told earlier, Jessica Whitwell is one of the four most powerful people in the government. Well, who obviously is number one, at least in title, if not in actual magical ability, okay? So she's one of the next four, next three. Probably he's one of those. And then in terms of the others, it's never clearly spelled out. Okay, so his boss realizes how strong and powerful he is, and what does he do? He puts him in charge of finding and breaking the resistance. 
Now, from the previous book, what was our impression of the resistance? How, how much of a thorn in the side of the government were they? Thieves. Stealing magical things. Not great magical things like the Amulet of Samarkand. Okay? But we're told little things. Mowlers, Moolers, however you pronounce it. Little orbs, things like that. Okay? What else? So they're stealing stuff. They're causing explosions. They're doing vandalism. They're like stinging bugs. Enough of a problem that you got to deal with them, but they're not going to bring government to its knees. Okay? So, top of 31, why has the resistance become so important? Because they, according to the government line, attempted to assassinate the prime minister. Who believes that? That is, who, who knows that's not true, first of all? Nathaniel does. <clears throat> the Prime Minister does. Whitwell does. I think it's probably safe to assume Duval does. Whether these others do, not quite clear. Okay? Who did they know was behind it? Loveless. Who else? His master. Skyler, um, Rufus Lime, the older fat guy. Do they know who else was behind it? No. But there are others who were involved who haven't yet been captured. Okay? They don't get revealed, really, until the third book. Okay? So, he knows of three members of the Resistance. Three commoners who he's dealt with, Bartimaeus has dealt with, these three, right? Which have what kind of stra uh, strange ability? They can see the powers. They can see the powers. They can detect magical objects. They're not supposed to. Okay. Then we get introduced to Jane Farrar. Okay. A few years older than Nathaniel. So he's not quite 15. I think she's four years older. So she's early 19s, let's say. Good looking. Powerful in her own right. And we're told, page 34, the kind of experiences they have. Three or four years older. Jane Farrar was three or four years older than he was. Just as tall, perhaps taller. Long, straight, light brown hair. Eyes disconcerting green. Disconcerting, what does that mean? He looks into her eyes and what's ha what happens? He kind of goes all weak need. That's what the disconcerting means. She's got killer eyes, in other words. Okay? Alive with wry intelligence. He could not help feeling gawky and inelegant beside her. Despite the splendors of his rough red handkerchief, he found himself trying to justify his statement where he should have kept silent. In other words, what does he do when he gets in her presence? He tries to show off. Typical, you know, male strutting his feathers kind of a thing. Okay? And he messes up. So, um, page 35, he's talking to a couple of his imps. Uh, excuse me, foliots, dressed as orphans. And they've been out on the streets trying to befriend commoner members of the resistance. And they tell him that children throw things at them. And he's outraged. He says, what? Oh, cans, bottles. He goes, I don't mean that. He goes, I mean... What's happened to a spot of common humanity? Kind of interesting coming from him, right? Because how much attention does he pay to common street urchins? He doesn't. And one of the foliots says, it's almost as if they can see us as we really are. Impossible. They don't have lenses, right? Because magicians wear lenses. Remember for what purpose? 
to see beyond the first plane. Go back for just a moment to page two, where the seven planes are mentioned. Right? And the footnote says, everybody can see on the first plane. Why? The first plane is ordinary material things, trees, buildings, humans, animals, etc. The other six contain spirits, spirits of various kinds. Magicians can get lenses that enable them to see levels two and three. So, for example, when Nathaniel, at six years of age, went to his master's study, picked up the glasses, put them on, and finally saw what was in the room and sees all these imps, he has only seen levels two and three. All right? There are four, five, six, and seven. Four more levels. Why can't they see beyond that? Because apparently they don't have a technology that enables them to create something like that. And that's one of the reasons why they can't fully see that Ramuthra thing. They see the effects it has, etc. Okay? So, go on. Let's see here. We see the little play, chapter three, which we're going to skip, and we get a lot of history, pages 45 and following. What do we learn about? We learn about Kitty's family, okay? So we learn, for example, bottom of page 45, top of page 46. What does Kitty's father think about magicians? They protect us. They serve the common good. Okay? He says the night spheres keep us safe. What are the spheres? We don't have those, these in our world. Well, take that back. We do have a version of them. These are things that, that orbit around, that hover around. In fact, you can even now have an even more closer version of them. They're kind of like CCTV. Okay? But imagine CCTV on drones. That's why I said we're getting even closer. Um, I think the number is something like, it's like 10 or 15 times a day. If you live in Washington, D.C. or New York, you're caught on CCTV on average, something like 10 or 15 times a day. That is, you're, you're on tape somewhere. In London, it's like 100 times a day. Because you literally, you can't walk down in the center of London, okay, which is about four or five miles long by two or three miles wide, essentially. You can't walk down anywhere in London without seeing on a building, any building, a CCTV camera. They're, they're everywhere. Okay? But even if the, you don't see the CCTV camera, what do you walk by? When you're in a big city and you're walking down a street, you know, and there's a bank. What does every bank have on the outside of a bank? An ATM. What does every ATM have? Every single one. That's how bad guys often get caught, you know, from detonating explosion. There's a camera across the street. And with the Photoshop kind of technology, we zoom it in, etc. Well, these spheres, these are just moving all over the place. Yeah, I'm kind of paranoid. I kind of think, you know, we're probably moving that way with drones and such. Um, okay, so what else? Page 46, we're told. They took for granted the superiority of the magicians and fully accepted the unchanging nature of their rule. Notice, this is how it's supposed to be. Okay? They found it reassuring. What about Kitty? Well, we're going to see an experience Kitty has, which tells us why she doesn't trust me, magicians, but, but she doesn't trust them before that happens. Okay? So we find out what kind of house they live in. Small home, sitting room, kitchen downstairs, tiny bathroom, out back, upstairs, landing, two bedrooms. Okay. 
right? What else? Her father works in a shop, uh, is a shop floor manager, large department store. But after a while, he loses his job. And then his wife loses their, her job, page 49. But they can't do that, Kitty protests. Of course they can. It's their right. They protect the country, make us the greatest nation in the world. They have many privileges. Sucks to be us, but, you know, we're better off here than elsewhere, okay? So what is it that really turns Kitty against magicians? She and her friend, I don't have them listed here because she's not a member of the resistance. She and her friend, Jacob Hirnek, when they're about the age of 13, one day they're out and they're essentially playing cricket. Not real cricket because they don't have teams, but it's like you and a friend, you get a ball and a bat and a glove and you go and they throw and you hit and etc. Okay. Well, they're doing that in a park they're not supposed to be in. Why? It's a magician's park. And what happens? What happens to every little kid who's not supposed to be somewhere and they're hitting a ball? The ball breaks a window, right? Only this time it's not a window of a house. The ball goes over a fence and what does it hit? His newly restored Rolls Royce. Right? It hits his car, he's driving, and what does it cause him to do? He crashes. So now his Rolls Royce is ruined. Okay. Skip a bit. Page 63. They hear the crash, the breaking glass, etc. They get caught. They apologize, 65, 66 following. They say it was an accident. We didn't mean to be here. We didn't mean to do this. He says it's a private park. Kitty says it's not private. Well, it shouldn't be. Notice, it's not. That is, it is. <laughs> but it shouldn't be. Okay. And so he has his demon perform a punishment. We're told, top of 67, the Black Tumbler. Okay. We're told the name of the demon, Nemeides. Okay. So page 67 at the bottom. Kitty tries to drag Jacob away. He can't. He's deathly right. There's no point. We can't. And they hear it tapping. And this creature says, face me, child. That's better. Direct frontal contact. contact is preferable for the tumbler. Kitty says, please don't hurt us. The yellow eyes widened. Excuse me, widened. Black lips made a rueful pout. What does rueful mean? See, we don't use the word rue anymore. Like, I rue the day. That means I feel bad. I feel sorry. I wish the day had never happened. So a rueful pout is this creature is expressing what? Regret. I really don't want to do this. But it's what? It's bound. It is being controlled by somebody else. If this creature doesn't perform its master's commands, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be tortured. So, you or me? Uh, you. <laughs> I am afraid that it's impossible. I have been given my orders. Notice, it. its very words imply, if I were a free agent, I wouldn't be doing this. I've been giving my orders, namely to affect the black tumbler upon your persons. I cannot reject this charge without great danger to myself. By telling us, if I don't do this, I will suffer great danger. The creature's telling us, 
I am doing this only under threat of coercion. Demon? Not in the popular consciousness, not in the, you know, um, the exorcist consciousness, because those kinds of demons, what? Sure. In fact, I don't even need an order. I'm just going to play with your mind. I'm going to torture you, etc. Would you have me become subject to the shriveling fire? And Kitty, you know, well, okay, if we're going to be honest here, yes, I would. <laughs> no doubt. Well, the situation is unpleasant. How's that for, you know, understatement? I suggest we get it over with as rapidly as possible. So what happens? Kitty barely gets the force of this black tumbler, but Jacob doesn't. Jacob gets it full force, okay? And we're going to be told later on what that is. Okay, so let's skip on a little bit. We see poor Sholto Pin has another building destroyed. Okay. And I'm going to skip a bit. Go on to, I don't know what chapter that is, uh, pages 90 and following. Right. So, Nathaniel's still trying to figure out the resistance. Now what's happened? Not only Sholto Penn's business has been destroyed, but a bunch of others as well. They've got to figure out who's doing this. Okay. We're told Julius Tallow assumes it's the resistance. Middle of the page. Julius Tallow was a fool. Whose perspective is this being told from? Nathaniel's. He appeared complacent, but like a weak swimmer out of his depth. His legs were kicking frantically under the surface, trying to keep him afloat. Whatever happened, notice, Nathaniel did not intend to sink with him. In other words, Nathaniel's not going to make the same mistake he made with his previous master. Julius Tallow is not his master, however, he's just his boss. Okay? But... Transfer this to our modern-day kind of work world. What happens if in your job um, you do something, if you have a job, you do something that makes your boss look really good? What could happen to your boss? Promotion. What happens if you do something that makes your boss look really good and your boss gives all the credit to you? You might get a promotion. How often is that really going to happen? Eh, probably not. Okay. What happens if you do something that makes your boss look really bad? What could happen to your boss? Demotion. But is your boss going to take the quote-unquote blame for that? Or is the boss going to blame you? What we're being told here is no matter what happens to Julius Tallow, um, Nathaniel isn't binding himself to him. Okay? Nathaniel's going to rise or fall on his own. So they go in to one of the destroyed buildings, a deli, and we hear Tallow say, so here they are, here they are, Duval's best men. And what do they see? Six piles of ash. Former human beings, now ash. Okay. And we're told, middle page 91, Julius kind of keeps talking. Nathaniel said nothing. He found the minister's callousness harder to stomach than the remains which were, after all, very neatly piled. Okay. So what is Tallow showing us here as opposed to Nathaniel? We're told Nathaniel sees callousness in his character. What does that mean? What, what is a callous? If you get a callous on your body, you know, I've got some right here on my hands. What is that? It's a thickening, toughening of skin. Why? so that it doesn't break, so that it doesn't get hurt easily. He's callous. Why? Well, probably with this job, 
He has to see what? Here I'm trying to I'm trying to read the best into the character. I'm trying to apply, you know, quote unquote, Christian charity to it. Well, think of a cop. Brother in law's an ex cop. He was a cop for 27 years or so. He did narc, he did all kinds of stuff. But one of his more, most horrific cases was an axe murder. This is a small town in Northern California. And he was one of the first guys on the scene. And just, you know, ran everywhere. And there were like two or three people involved. Okay? You see that kind of thing in, in what happens when you come back out. <laughs> You're not the same. That involves having to harden yourself. He saw the effects of, quote, unquote, you know, drugs on people. So that when he would come up, you know, against drug dealers, not individual users, not somebody with a dime bag or something like that. Now I don't know what it is. Ten dollar bag or whatever. You know, but he saw the effects. So, you know, you'd be a little harder on the dealers. Because the dealers are the ones who create the users, etc. Notice, how does Nathaniel think this guy's callous, though? Because you might be callous, does that mean you become unfeeling, uncaring? That's what Tallow is. Tallow treats these six dead men as what? Nothing. Nothing. Whereas Nathaniel sees them as one, family, children, wife, parents, etc. Okay? Two, three, four, five, six. Okay? So he keeps asking Nathaniel, you know, any ideas, any ideas? And Nathaniel finally he gets tired of it and says, I don't know, sir, what do you think? Why does he ask him that question? Because he knows. <laughs> Tallow doesn't know anything. The guy's an idiot. Okay? But Nathaniel obviously isn't. So, we're told, you know, he calls, Tallow calls his right-hand spirit, so to speak, forward, which tells him what the spirit has detected. And Tallow waves him off, page 92, and says, that will be all, Nemeides, you may go. Now, when I introduced the scene with Jacob Hirnak and Kitty in the Black Tumbler, I mentioned that the guy in the Rolls Royce was Julius Tallow. We don't know that at the time, though. The only connection we get is when he dismisses his servant here as Nemeides. And we now know Nathaniel is working for the boss, his boss, who cursed the girl he's come into contact with and her best friend. Why is that important? Well, at this point in the story, it's not. But little foreshadowing. I'm going to give you a little foreshadow. It's not in the story. Nathaniel and Kitty are going to become friends. Okay. So, Nathaniel thinks it has something to do with magicians. This isn't, this isn't resistance work. Why? It's too major. It's too extensive. He says, no, no, no. You've got to find some resistance link. Okay? So he puts him officially in charge. He says, I hope you have a, a imp, a demon, up to the task. So we get a little chapter about who Nathaniel has been trying to get. First he used an imp, nothing. He wasn't going to, you know, bring forth Bartimaeus. He brings forth a foliot, no good. A Jenny, no good. 96, he'd resolve not to mention or not to summon Bartimaeus again. Okay. So, 
pages 98 and following. It's Founders Day coming up. And he gets in the limo with Jessica Whitwell to go to the prime minister's house. He's been invited to go to. And she tells him, page 98, Mr. Devereaux wants to know what we're doing about it. Notice I said we, John. As security minister, I'm responsible for internal affairs. I will be under some pressure over this. My enemies will seek to gain advantage over me. I misspoke earlier. Police, Henry Duvall, they are not under this. He is her greatest enemy. I, I don't know what made me think of that earlier. Um, what will I tell them about this disaster? Have you made arrests? He's uh, no. Who's to blame? Don't know. And so he asks, is Tallow coming to Richmond? She says, no, he's not. I'm bringing you because Mr. Devereaux has a liking for you, which may stand in our favor. Mr. Tallow is less presentable. I find him bumptious and incompetent. You're a bright boy, John. You understand that if the prime minister loses patience with me, I will lose patience with those below. Notice the threat here. If I lose power, you lose power. If I gain power, you gain power. Okay? Young as you are, you can be blamed for things quite easily. Mr. Tallow is, seeks to displace responsibility onto you. So, they go to Richmond, and we hear the discussions, what's going on and such, and... The Prime Minister says, page 104, you know, let's hear what John Mandrake has to say. Or excuse me, he introduces kind of went well with Mandrake. And Mr. Duvall says, who does not know the great John Mandrake? Okay. He's police chief. He's in his 40s or 50s. He says, who does not know him? And he's what? What's he saying? This kid's too big for his britches. People are putting too much emphasis on him. Okay? So, let's see here. Page 106. Ms. Whitwell says Mr. Mandrake is conducting the case. Let's hear him. And what does he say? We don't have any real firm evidence to tell whether or not the resistance is involved at all. There are odd aspects. What does he mean there are odd aspects? It's like this would be evidence that would say it can't be resistance. Okay. Duvall and others are up in arms against this idea. So Whitwell kind of starts to ask him questions. No evidence of impsudent? No, he says no. No conventional magical traces. Okay. Mr. Duvall says we need more power to the graybacks. What's he mean? More power to the police. How, how do you get more power to the police? You take it from somewhere else. Like the security apparatus. And notice... This guy's in his 40s or 50s. He's a hardened warrior, so to speak. And Nathaniel says, with respect, six of your wolves were not enough last night. What's he mean? I saw their piles of ash. Whatever did this to them, um, you could have had 12. And there would be 12 piles of ash. So Devereaux says, what is your suggestion? And now this is it. This is his chance. This is his moment to shine. Okay. And he says, I think there's every reason to think they will strike again. Where did they strike before? They struck a tourist spot. So we need to have extra surveillance. Surveillance. Not more cops. Surveillance. Okay. He says, all right. Well, do, take your idea, and that's when he comes up with the idea of summoning Bartimaeus. Why Bartimaeus? He can trust him. Why, why else? 
He helped get him out of a jam before. Okay, he's not weak. And we're told one ten. As always, I tried to resist. As always, what does that mean? How old is Bartimaeus? Well, he was five thousand five. Now he's five thousand seven years old. He's been summoned a lot of times. Every time. Notice, from the other place, whatever the spirit is, it tries to resist. It doesn't want to be forced into what? This. Into material form. Okay? Because this is restricting and painful, we're told later on. So, Bartimaeus comes back. He and John go back and forth. Um, John lies to him, says, you know, your name show up in an almanac, people are going to, he says, that's lying. He says, okay, here's, here's what we'll do. Six weeks. Give me six weeks. Okay. And he says, okay, I'll, I'll agree and I won't reveal your name. Let's skip a bit. Let's see here. Part two. Um, part two begins, and we leave all this group aside, and we see this group, right? And they're talking about what? Well, what happened the night of that play that we saw part of? There was a resistance attack. It wasn't the resistance attack at Cholto Pins that um, Nathaniel's been charged to investigate. It was a fire, essentially. And we're told on page 127 that Kitty says <clears throat> people were hurt, Stanley. Commoners. Collaborate. Running to save their master's rugs. Well, can't you just? Okay, so notice what that tells us about the resistance. It's kind of like this, right? Here you have people out, out to get power. Out for themselves. Here, it's not that they're necessarily out to get power. Or out to get... get um, what they can for themselves. Think of the relationship of these two. He describes Talos' reaction to the six dead cops as callous. She describes his reaction, essentially, to commoners being hurt. But she doesn't say it's callous. She just says, commoners, people were hurt, Stanley. Commoners. What does that tell us? What is she all for in terms of the resistance? Let's have a tax. Yes. But not what? Not collateral damage. Let's not have people, especially people like us, commoners get hurt. Stanley's like, they're collaborators. See, we think of collaborator because it's it's been lost, you know, this other meaning. We think of collaborator, oh, well, that's someone who helps you with something. You collaborate. Cool. Right? But it has an entirely different meaning in history. Collaborators, Second World War, were the French who aided the Nazis. Okay? And when other French who weren't aiding the Nazis got hold of them, they killed them. I mean, it was that, that bad. So if you were labeled as a collaborator, that was a death sentence. That's what Stanley is saying here. They deserve to die. Why? They are aiding and abetting magicians. Okay? So, we see the commoners, and we find out a couple of the commoners, like Anne, can what? They can see through someone's Excuse me. They can see through a demon's magical disguise. So if a demon comes up disguised as a person 
and can see what that thing really is, right? Um, skip a bit again, and we go to chapter 12. And where are we taken to? Back to a couple of years previous, or at least a year previous, when Jacob Hernick and Kitty are 13. After the Black Tumbler. And we get the description of Jacob on page 135. Where his hair had protected him, Jacob's skin was its normal swarthy color, that is, dark. Everywhere else, from the base of his neck right up to his hairline, it was seared or stained with roughly vertical wavy streaks of black and gray, the color of ash and burned wood. So, his face and all of his skin has lines in it, like that. Okay? So then anybody who sees him automatically knows what? If they know the magical spell, oh, Black Tumbler got you, didn't it? All right? Well, what do we see in that chapter? What does Kitty think? In fact, it's not just that chapter. It's that chapter and the one after it. What does Kitty want for justice uh, for herself and I said it, for Jacob? Justice. Where does she think she's going to get it? Magician's court. So she gets there. She files a suit. She gets her day in court. What does the judge ask about Jacob? Where is he? She says he's afraid to show up. Oh, why would he be afraid to show up? He didn't think he'd get a fair shake. And what does the judge do? He threatens her essentially with contempt. How dare you say such a thing? And yet, okay, so why does Stroud do this? Why, why does Stroud depict justice as not being like we think it is, or like our system says it is, impartial, or it's magicians versus the commoners. Can we apply this to our world and not use magicians and commoners? What what could the magicians be? Our world. Wealthy, and then this would be, is it necessarily the poor? No, it's not. It's what? Every Everybody else. Okay. Here's an example. Um, and this is nothing about the, the president at the time. This is the individual the president nominated. One of the people President Obama nominated for a cabinet level position, Secretary of the Treasury, was a guy named Timothy Geithner. When Geithner was approved by the Senate, he owed several hundred thousand dollars in back taxes. Okay, what would happen if Ashland owed several hundred thousand dollars in back taxes? Or Kira, or Shelby, or Julie, or me? Uh, would I get approved for tax? No. What would happen if I didn't pay it? I'd go to jail. <laughs> okay. Many would argue that's the two-tier justice system. Okay, we'll stop there. Got almost where I needed to get to. And we'll pick up with, I don't know, probably somewhere in that chapter 14. Sorry, for those of you whose papers I, um, no, I'm thinking different class. Never mind.